today we shall be looking at two of Paul's letters together, the second and third letter that he wrote, which we know as 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Written to the church in the Greek city of Thessaloniki on the Aegean Sea. The letter is introduced as being from Paul, Silvanus or Silas and Timothy and sent to the Church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, begins with the usual greetings of grace and peace. Paul founded the church himself in Thessaloniki just a year or so before sending the first letter, while he was on his second missionary journey. He was only in the city a short time because he was forced out by the enemies of the gospel. Yet the Church of the Thessalonians continued alive and active. Though Paul had to suddenly leave this young church, his deep concern for them prompted this letter. Silvanus, or Silas, was a long-standing and experienced companion of Paul. He travelled with Paul on his second missionary journey, and he was imprisoned and set free with Paul from the Philippian jail. When Paul first came to Thessaloniki, Silas was with him, therefore the Thessalonians knew him well. Timothy was a resident of Lystra, a city in the province of Galatia. Timothy was a trusted companion and associate of Paul, and he accompanied Paul on many of his missionary journeys. Paul had sent Timothy to the Thessalonians on a previous occasion. The origins of the Thessalonian church is found in Acts chapter 17. The church was birthed in persecution and violence. Paul and Silas came into town and taught in the synagogue about the Messiah Jesus. Several believed, including several prominent women. But the religious leaders were furious. One believer there was dragged before a court. His name was Jason. Jason was a hospitable believer, welcoming Paul and Silas. He believed in an ultimate sovereign king, Jesus, more than the king of the land. He held on to his faith while facing an angry mob. We should never let go of faith. We have to have a receptive heart that remains convicted and settled on following Jesus. After these two letters to the Thessalonians, the next letter Paul would write would be his first letter to the church in Corinth. In that letter he would declare, Now abide faith, hope and love, and the greatest of these is love. Paul appears to preempt this triumvirate as he gratefully remembers the Thessalonians' work of faith, labour of love, and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. This goes beyond the concepts of faith, hope and love, to the actions of faith, hope and love, a work of faith, a labour of love, a patience of hope. Living the life of faith would be one of active work and service. Faith is always active, it's not just a matter of prayer and conviction. It's evidenced by seeking God and by serving others. Love is spoken of as overflowing for all people, taught by God and a protection for Christians. When the pressure is on, do we still allow the life of faith to produce loving deeds for others? We are a people of hope, not because we have all the answers, but because we have the answer. Jesus is our only hope, and we put all our trust in him. We need to always pray that God will remind us of the hope we have in Christ, and to never let anything shake that. The gospel comes in word, in power, and in the Holy Spirit creating the church at Thessaloniki, and spreading the gospel across Macedonia and Achaia. Paul declares that these disciples have turned from idols to the living and true God and wait for his Son from heaven. 
we receive the good news with power. God has the power to change our lives and to save our souls and to use us to love and to bless others. We receive the assurance from the Holy Spirit as we read the Bible, as we live out the message. We're called to imitate Jesus Christ, and as we do so, we become an example to all believers. Are we setting an example of faith, hope and love for the world around us? Are we known for being a people of faith, hope and love? Paul finished this first chapter by telling them two things. They had a faith that everyone talked about, and they had a reputation for looking forward to the second coming of Christ. Paul gives a defence for the modus operandi of him and his co-workers. They didn't act from error, uncleanness or covetousness. They never used flattery. They didn't seek glory from men. They were gentle, hard-working to preach the gospel of God. They had a fatherly relationship to the church, who welcomed the gospel not as the word of men, but as the word of God. The Thessalonians suffered at the hands of their fellow countrymen. Paul was eager to visit the Thessalonians, who are in glory and joy, but Satan hindered him. Just as God uses people to bring the gospel to the lost, so he uses people to nurture the babes in Christ, and to help lead them to maturity. The church at Thessaloniki was born through the faithful preaching of the apostle and his helpers, and the church was nurtured through the faithful pastoring that Paul and his friends gave to the infant church. This helped them stand strong in the midst of persecution. A steward owns nothing but possesses and uses everything that belongs to his master. Every steward one day must give account of his stewardship. The message of the gospel is a treasure God has entrusted to us. We must not bury it. We must invest it so it will multiply and produce spiritual fruit to God's glory. Faithfulness is the most important quality a steward possesses. He may not be popular in the eyes of men, but he dare not be unfaithful in the eyes of God. Paul and Silas had been beaten and humiliated at Philippi, yet they came to Thessaloniki and preached. I'm sure most of us would have found an excuse not to minister. But Paul was courageous. He would not give up. Here he assured them that his message was true. Paul received this gospel from God, not from man. It is the only good news that saves the lost sinner. Paul's motives were pure. It is possible to preach the right message with the wrong motives. Unfortunately, some people in Paul's day used religion as a means of making money. Paul was very sensitive about money matters. As an apostle, he had the privilege of receiving support. But he gave up that right in order to be free from any possible blame that would disgrace the ministry. Paul did not use trickery to win converts. He didn't trap people into being saved. The emphasis of the steward is faithfulness. The emphasis of a mother is gentleness. As an apostle, Paul was a man of authority, but he always used his authority in love. These babes in Christ sensed his tender, loving care as he nurtured them. He was indeed like a loving mother who cares for her children. It takes time and energy to care for children. Paul did not turn his converts over to babysitters. He made sacrifices himself and cared for them. Paul had patience with the new Christians. He nurtured them. You cannot be a nursing mother 
and turn your baby over to someone else. The baby must be in your arms, next to your heart. Beside making sacrifices, having patience and giving nourishment, a mother also protects her child. Paul was willing to give not only the gospel, but his own life as well. Paul considered himself a spiritual father to the believers at Thessaloniki. But the father not only begets his children, he also cares for them. As he defended his own work against false accusations, Paul pointed out his duties as spiritual father to the Thessalonians. The father works to support his family. Even though the Christians in Philippi sent financial help, Paul still made tents and paid his own way. No one could accuse him of using his ministry for his own profit. Fathers must live so that they are good examples to their children. He could call the Thessalonian believers as witnesses that his life had been exemplary in every way. His life was lived to carefully fulfil the duties God had given him. His life was also righteous, demonstrated in integrity, uprightness of character and behaviour. Paul's life was unblameable. His enemies might accuse him, but no one could level any charge against Paul and prove it. A father must not only support the family by working and teach the family by being a good example, he must also take time to speak to family members. Paul knew the importance of teaching these new believers the truth that would help them grow in the Lord. Paul encouraged the new believers. New Christians need someone to encourage them in the Lord. Paul also comforted them. This word carries the same idea of encouragement with the emphasis on activity. Paul not only made them feel better, but he made them want to do better. Finally, Paul challenged them. This word means that Paul testified to them out of his own experience with the Lord. It carries the idea of giving personal witness. Sometimes we go through difficulties so that we can share with new Christians what the Lord has done. His aim was that his children might walk worthy of the Lord. Just as a father wants to be proud of his children, so the Lord wants to get the glory through the lives of his children. The church at Thessaloniki prospered in spite of persecution and shared the gospel with others for miles around. They had been born right and nurtured right. It was not easy to be a Christian in Thessaloniki where people suffered persecution. Yet in the midst of suffering, the Thessalonian Christians experienced joy. Churches will experience growing pains as they seek to win the lost and glorify the Lord. The church is founded on the word of God, the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The same word that brings us salvation also enables us to look for Christ and endure suffering for his sake. We must never treat the Bible as just another book. It is the word of God. God's word is holy, pure, perfect. The way a Christian treats his Bible shows how he regards Jesus Christ. We must hear with the ear, but also hear with the heart. These believers not only heard the word, they took it into their hearts and made it part of their lives. They obeyed the word by faith, and the word went to work in their lives. It's not enough to appreciate the Bible, or even to appropriate the Bible. We must apply the Bible in our lives and be hearers and doers of the word. There is great power 
in the Christian who applies the word to his life. Paul encouraged the suffering Christians by assuring them that their experience were not new or isolated. We need each other as a source of encouragement during tough times. Those who have been through tough times could be a great encourager to those that are going through similar situations. Christians need other Christians for encouragement. Paul says we must persist despite problems. God will work in you and through you if you allow him to. Christians have the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. Everyone needs someone to encourage them. So often we're good at telling people their faults and how they can improve things, but we're not very good at encouraging them to continue on. When things get tough, it's easy to want to quit. But God can use someone just to be there in that time of need and use them as an encourager. God used Paul as an encourager to the church in Thessaloniki. Not only was Paul concerned about their safety, he was concerned about their spiritual growth. Paul knew that these new Christians were going to be tempted and persecuted, and he tried to prepare them for that, so that when it happened, they would not fall away. It was literally driving Paul crazy that he couldn't be there to see if they were growing or giving up. So Paul sent Timothy to the Thessalonians to see if their faith was still strong. Being concerned is not enough. Our concern must put us into action. Although Paul couldn't go and see, he was able to send Timothy. It's not that hard to be concerned about people, but it is more challenging to do something about it especially when there are many barriers to doing it. I have noticed that in most situations, if you're doing a good job, no one ever tells you. If you're doing something wrong, generally you will hear about it very quickly. Timothy brought back an encouraging report and Paul is de delighted and keen to tell the church. The greatest thing you can ever do for someone is pray. Paul prayed that their faith might mature. Although Paul could not be there, he prayed that their relationship with Christ would grow stronger. He prayed that their love for others would grow. He prayed that their hearts would be strengthened so they would be holy and blameless. Paul then talks about sexual immorality. He talks about defrauding one another. He talks about uncleanness. But we can take this advice and deal with all types of sinful behaviour. I'm going to focus on these areas because that's what the text focuses on. What God tells us in his word is the all-time standard for holiness. It's not man's opinion and it's not culturally bound. God's word transcends culture and it transcends time. Paul is urging and exhorting the Thessalonians. He's telling them that they ought to walk to please God. He says, we gave you your commandments. A better translation of that would be, we gave you these instructions. And in the context of this passage, these instructions were given by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So if we disregard or ignore these instructions, we are, in effect, treating Almighty God with disrespect and not worthy of our obedience. We're saying that God is of no significance when compared to our own desires. When we think of God being almighty, omniscient, omnipresent, we can't help but think of his authority. He's also a just God. God's authority and God's justice helps us resist temptation and fight against sin. One of the greatest motivations for the Christian to pursue holiness is that God has personally and effectually 
called us to himself. We belong to him. We're not our own. We've been bought with a price. If you are a Christian, you're not in darkness. You've come into light. You have the Holy Spirit within you. And if you will walk in the Spirit, you will not be fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. You have been redeemed from slavery to sin. And you are a new creation in Christ. In this fight against sin, it's important to know who you are in Christ and whose you are. We often hear people, particularly preachers, talk about being led by the Spirit. What they mean is that the Holy Spirit will help you make plans and come to right decisions in life. But the only two places in the New Testament where it talks about believers being led by the Spirit, the context isn't really about that kind of leading. It's about being led into spiritual warfare or into temptation. The same phrase is also used in two other places in the New Testament, referring to Jesus being led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, where he went to war with the ultimate tempter himself, the devil. The Bible tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way during the course of his life, and he withstood every temptation that was thrown at him. He faced every sin imaginable, every sin known to man, every sin you or I could ever be tempted with, and he overcame. So in summary, there are four things, God's authority, God's justice, God's call, and God's spirit, that are weapons we can mount against sin. Four things we can look at and remind ourselves when we're tempted. We have some powerful weapons at our disposal. If there is one desperate need that almost every person has, it's hope. We have to remind ourselves constantly that God is on the throne and is in control. The word hope has been weakened to mean an expectancy that something might happen, with the question as to whether it really will. I hope nowadays carries the same sort of meaning as I wish. This is not the message of hope in the New Testament. Paul uses the word in the sense of absolute certainty. It has been said that hope means being so sure about the future that you can enjoy it in the present. The Thessalonian Christians were apparently experiencing strong anxiety over issues they did not understand. Paul obviously had taught them that Jesus was going to return. From what Paul had said, we can conclude that the Thessalonians were concerned about what would happen to believers who died before Jesus' return. Their ignorance of the hope of which Paul spoke has created anxiety for them, and it will create anxiety for us. Hope enables us to endure difficult days. Our hope is an assurance of eternal life. The Thessalonians were concerned that they never would see their Christian loved ones who had died. They also feared what would happen to them if they died before Jesus returned. Paul made it clear to them that death is not to be feared. Our hope is eternal life, and death is a springboard into personal fellowship with Jesus. In fact, Paul said that when Jesus comes, God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with him. Paul used the word sleep to describe the death of Christians. He spoke of the body, not the soul. As a sleeper continues to exist while the body sleeps, so the dead in Christ continue to exist, though separated from earthly existence. As sleep is temporary, so is the death of the body. The Greek word used for sleep means to lie down, and refers to the position of the body. 
as one awakens from sleep, so shall the body of Christians who have died be awakened at the coming of the Lord. The soul shall have been enjoying fellowship with Jesus, which begins immediately at the death of a Christian. That is our hope. Our hope is the resurrection of our bodies. Each one of us has a body, which is the material part of us. But we also have a part of us that is not material. The spirit is that part of us which communicates with God. It is this part of Christians that continues on in face-to-face relationship with Jesus after death. This face-to-face relationship is a part of our great hope. But another part of our hope is God's plan for the body. His plan is to give all Christians another body. Our bodies are weak and frail. The body gets tired, it wears out and breaks down. It's resistant to God's will. Paul said that when Jesus comes, the dead in Christ will rise first. The first thing that will happen when Jesus returns is that Christians who have departed this life will receive resurrected bodies. We're going to have a resurrected body like Jesus' resurrected body. Basically, Paul says, don't worry about those who have died. They are already with Jesus. They will come back with him, and their bodies will be woken up first. The text makes it clear that both living and previously dead Christians will be with Jesus in the air and with him forever. Our hope is also the coming of Jesus Christ. This involves two aspects. He's coming to claim his own, and he's coming to restore order to a sin-cursed world. Three words sum up what will happen when Jesus comes. Resurrection. The resurrection of believers is the first thing that will take place when Jesus comes. Rapture. The archangel will shout and a trumpet will sound. And those Christians who have already died will be resurrected to meet Jesus in the air. And then those Christians that remain will also meet him in the air. Reunion. Paul said, so will we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Christians will be reunited with other believers and even better, will spend an eternity in heaven with their saviour. All people need to hear this. Our hope is in Jesus. We will spend eternity with him in heaven if we put our faith in him. People need Jesus. God wants us to extend our reach and preach about our hope in Jesus. Paul makes it perfectly clear that he doesn't know when the Lord is returning to earth, nor does anyone else. Paul says that this is a fact that shouldn't even have to be discussed. He had already taught the believers that no one knows when the Lord is returning to earth, only God. So there's really no need to discuss times and dates. Times means chronological time. Paul has already covered the order of events that were to happen in the end time. He was saying that the times of the end time extend over a long chronological period. Date means the particular time and the nature of the events that are to take place. The very nature and happening of critical periods can be looked at and observed. Once a believer has studied the times and dates of the end times, he knows that only God could know when he is returning. There are just too many intricate details for any man to know when the fullness of time has come. Paul says it will come as a thief in the night, suddenly and unexpectedly. 
Believers are looking for the Lord's return, but unbelievers will be caught completely off guard. They will stand in terror at the appearing of Christ and at the judgments that will begin to fall upon the earth. The day of the Lord refers to the Lord's dealing with unbelievers when God will bring every soul into judgment. The day of the Lord will come when the world of unbelievers feel a sense of security. Some leaders throughout the world and some world organisations will cooperate and be able to achieve some semblance of peace and security. So people will be revelling in the security. And then it comes. The day of the Lord will be a catastrophic destruction. When the world is crying out for peace and safety, a terrible destruction will be lying right over the horizon. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the great and terrible day of the Lord will fall upon the world. Paul says destruction will come on them suddenly. It will be totally unexpected. It will be just like the birth pains that suddenly strike a woman who is expecting a child. The pain, the suffering, the destruction will be relentless. The day of the Lord will be a day of no escape. Paul says they will not escape. Judgment and destruction are an absolute certainty. All human beings who have not trusted Jesus will face the terrible day of the Lord. Jesus Christ both unites and divides. Those who have trusted Jesus as Saviour are united in him. When Jesus returns in the air, we shall be caught up together, never to be separated again. But Christ is also a divider. Those who reject him will be separated from the believers. Faith in Jesus not only unites to other believers, it also separates us spiritually from the rest of the world. There is a difference between believers who are looking for the Lord's return and the people of the world. It is this theme that Paul develops. His purpose was to encourage the believers to live holy lives in the midst of their non-Christian surroundings. Paul refers to a thief in the night, an image that Jesus himself used in his own teaching. It describes the suddenness and the surprise involved in the coming of the day of the Lord. The idea is used to warn believers not to be caught napping. Paul had told the Thessalonians about the coming of the Christ for the church. He told them that there would be a period of intense suffering and tribulation on the earth following this rapture of the church. These times and seasons that relate to Israel and the nations do not apply to the church or affect the truth of the Lord's coming for the church. He may come at any time. Paul's emphasis here was simply that the believers were in the know, while the unbelievers were living in ignorance of God's plan. The suddenness of these events will reveal to the world its ignorance of divine truth. The unsaved world will be enjoying a time of false peace and security just before the cataclysmic events occur. People will say that they are in the know while unbelievers are living in ignorance of God's plan. The suddenness of these events will reveal to the world its ignorance of divine truth. The unsaved world will be enjoying a time of false peace and security just before the cataclysmic events occur. They will say peace and safety, but we will say Jesus is coming. Judgment is coming. 
The world is caught by surprise because men will not hear God's word or heed God's warning. Christians are sons of the light and therefore are not in the dark when it comes to future events. Paul says we should live expectantly. This does not mean sitting around doing nothing and waiting for the Lord's return. In fact, the disciples at the beginning of the book of Acts were rebuked for this attitude. There is a difference between being ready to go to heaven and being ready to meet with the Lord. Anyone who has trusted in Christ for salvation is ready to go to heaven. But being ready to meet Jesus at the judgment seat is another matter. Paul tells us in his first letter that not all believers will be happy to see Jesus. Believers who live in the expectation of the Lord's return will certainly enjoy a better life than Christians who compromise with the world. Paul tells us to be sober-minded, to be alert, to live with our eyes open, to be sane and steady. To make the contrast clear, Paul pictured two groups of people. One group was drunk and asleep. The other group was awake and alert. Danger was coming, but the drunken sleepers were unaware of it. The alert crowd was ready and unafraid. Since we are sons of the day, we should not live as those who belong to the darkness. It is time to wake up, to clean up, and to dress up. We must not be complacent, frustrated, or afraid. We know that we are secure in God's hands. When Paul talks about the hope of our salvation, he doesn't mean a hope that at long last we will be saved. We can know today that we are saved and going to heaven. Hope of salvation means the hope that salvation gives to us. This is the assurance that I have been saved from the guilt and penalty of my sin, that I am being saved from the power and pollution of sin, and that I shall be saved from the very presence of sin when Christ returns. Believers do not have to fear judgment because it's not part of God's appointed plan for us. Christians have always gone through tribulation, since this is a part of dedicated Christian living. But they will not go through the great tribulation. That is appointed for a godless world. When Christ died on a cross, he bore for us all the divine judgment necessary for our salvation. He's promised that we shall never taste of any of God's wrath. What are some of the ingredients of church growth? What makes a church great in God's sight? Any church that is in love with Christ and the things of God will be a great church. Paul refers to practices of a growing church. The members live godly lives. The testimony and power of a church is often destroyed because the members live inappropriate or ungodly lives. Godliness is not an impossible dream. It can be a reality in the lives of Christians because God desires it. He has the power to make it happen. God is faithful. We can rely on him. Members pray for their leaders. Praying members are so vital to a growing and powerful church. Members love each other. Existence of factions can cause the death of a church. God's people need to be friendly and open to one another. Holy means that greeting is an expression of Christian love toward fellow believers that is real and void of hypocrisy. All the brethren gives the extent of the greeting. Everyone in the church is to be greeted in a sincere and loving manner. The members study their Bibles. No church can be great in God's sight apart from a serious study of God's word. Each member must learn as much of God's word as they can. Paul put the Thessalonians under a solemn duty to read his epistle to the entire congregation. 
Paul wanted his readers to learn the doctrines and instructions of God contained in the Scriptures. A growing church gives top priority to the study of God's words. Members have the grace of God. The grace of God is essential for both salvation and for Christian living. Salvation comes by grace through faith. The grace of God enables us to continue in the Christian life and be more like Christ. It is a specific grace. It is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, this grace has its origin and example in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Lord gives grace for every trial to those who humble themselves before him, a grace that is sufficient for every need and any trouble that we may encounter. Paul writes his second letter to the church at Thessaloniki about a year after the first one. This letter again comes from Paul, Silas and Timothy and begins with the stated greetings of grace and peace. Paul starts by giving thanks to God for the church, but this is not general thanksgiving. Specifically, he thanks God for the faith within the church that is growing, and the love for one another that is increasing more and more. He then tells the church he boasts about them to other churches, specifically about their faith and perseverance with the challenges that they are facing. Remember, this is not a pastor boasting of his own flock. This is a visiting evangelist who is in contact with dozens of churches, who is praising this one church for their actions and attitudes. The Thessalonians are being persecuted because they are Christians. Yet God would vindicate them, as Paul says, As a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. We must pray for those who, even today, are suffering for the cause of righteousness. Believers in many parts of the world are persecuted for their profession of Christ, cast out by their families and communities, under constant threat from neighbours and former friends, and subject to harassment and murder from those who should protect them. Paul said he prayed for them to be counted worthy, of the life and destiny which God already has in store for them. It is only God's grace that makes us worthy. It is only God's power that makes it possible. That glorification of Jesus is already being fulfilled by degrees in his people, in the here and now, as we grow in him. Thereby Jesus is glorified in us and we in him, to the glory of God's grace. As Paul words it, then everyone will be praising the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because of the results they see in you, and your greatest glory will be that you belong to him. The tender mercy of our God and of the Lord Jesus Christ has made all of this possible for you. Paul returns to the theme he covered in the first letter of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the rapture of the church. He told the church, please don't be upset and excited, dear brothers, by the rumour that this day of the Lord has already begun. The word upset, or shaken in many translations, describes a ship that is tossed in the middle of a stormy sea. Do not be troubled or fearful, Paul says. Paul further encourages them not to be deceived. Why give this encouragement and warning? because the last days will be days when many will be deceived. He gives them reasons that they should not be deceived. Paul now shares with them something which must happen prior to the second coming of the Lord. There will be a great defection or departure from the faith and from truth. There have throughout the history of the church been times of apostasy, Yet the days preceding the Church of Christ will be days when more and more will fall away from the truth of the Scriptures. We, as believers, must remain faithful to the Word of God, faithful to speak the truth, and faithful to take a stand for decency, for morality. God will judge those who don't. 
Paul says that all true Christians would leave the earth, an event we call the rapture. In fact, Paul fully expected this event to take place in his lifetime. If Paul thought the coming of the Lord was near then, how much closer are we to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ now? This imminence should move each of us to be certain of our relationship with God. Not only does the church disappear from the world, but so does the Holy Spirit. This leaves the spirit of the Antichrist free to work. The one thing preventing the man of sin, the Antichrist, from coming on the scene and being revealed is the Spirit of God, and he will be removed. The man of sin, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, will make his appearance following the rapture of the church. He begins with harmful works in a subtle way. God now sends a strong delusion upon those who are left behind, who have received not the love of truth that they may be saved. Their destination is now sealed, as they are damned because they didn't believe the truth, but rather loved pleasure. Paul then describes the enemy who first opposes God and stands as God, seating himself in the holy temple. He shows himself with power, with signs and various lying wonders. At the end of the tribulation period, the Antichrist will be defeated and cast into hell, as recorded in Revelation 19. Paul closes this eschatological section with a benediction. A prayer asking God to comfort the church and establish them so that they would focus on good words and good works. Paul begins to wind down his letter to the Thessalonians asking for prayer. All of us who have trusted in Christ are part of a team and prayer is one of our solemn responsibilities. Jesus said that we should pray for the harvest and for the labourers Specifically, Paul requests that they should pray for the opportunity, for the message to be shared, and that it will be received. He further asks for prayers of protection from those who would try to stop the message. Paul then reassures them that God is faithful. But we so often misunderstand this. We think God is faithful as long as everything turns out well for us. But consider the testimony of Corrie Ten Boom. She said God is good when he sends good weather. But God was also good when he allowed my sister Betsy to starve to death before my eyes in a German concentration camp. There is an ocean of God's love available. There is plenty for everyone. May God grant you never to doubt that victorious love, whatever the circumstances. The Lord is faithful. No matter what circumstances we're in, we can be assured of his hand upon us, protecting us from the enemy and strengthening us even through difficulty. Paul then says something truly lovely. Can we say this about our churches? We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. All too often, human wisdom within me shouts that there's another way to do things, that I should live for my own pleasure, that when I yield to that voice, it doesn't bring harmony. Peace comes when I yield to the commands of God and work as part of the team. Paul ends the letter with a warning. It's interesting to me that the warning is at the end. Why put it right at the end? I believe... It's because it was a serious problem that needed to be handled. And Paul wanted it to be on their mind as they finished reading the letter. The warning was against idleness. Being lazy, not doing anything. He says not to associate with lazy people. The church in Thessaloniki was turning into a welfare centre for the lazy. Paul tells us not to allow them to use us and take from everyone while they do nothing. 
Paul and the other ministers worked long hours as they ministered and also worked secular jobs, choosing to not receive a salary from the church. They were an example to the church in how to work hard and they wanted that to spread through the church. When people have nothing productive to do, they will find something to use up their time. And one of the most popular things is to interfere with someone else's business. Paul tells them to encourage these idle people to settle down, get back to work and earn their keep. We need to stay busy. Paul says, keep going, don't conform to the wrong things, but keep pushing for that which is good. For those who refuse to work, we're told not to associate with them, but to treat them as strangers, not as enemies. We are to warn them about their behaviour out of love, but we should desire to see them change. For ourselves, keep busy, keep going and keep looking up. If you would like to know more, then do contact us at any of the contact addresses given on this slide. Or, if you're in the Radstock area one Sunday morning, why not join us at the Baptist Church for our half past ten service? You would always be very welcome. <laughs>